So we're so delighted to host this uh, event today. Um, the, Israel, uh, the Inclusion Task Force in connection with ATEAM. Um, and through our partnership with the Israeli Stage Productions, TBS is proud to welcome playwright and performing art artist, that's Ali Zuckerman, as she shares personal insight about her identity as other in Israeli society, her work as a performance artist, and her inclusion advocacy uh, for art ability, a movement of artists with disabilities. Um, as part of her sharing, she will perform pieces from her critically acclaimed piece, The Other Body. At the age of 12, uh, Natalie was severely injured in a youth camp, leaving her disabled for life and with the unfulfilled fantasy of becoming a professional dancer. Zuckerman's severe neural back injury is almost invisible, and she does not fulfill the stereotypes of a disabled woman, creating a dissonance between what is physically visible and what is internal. Uh, and we'd like to um, invite you afterwards to be part of a Q&A session and also to enjoy refreshments afterwards. And we hope that you enjoy this wonderful experience that we are so excited to host. Thank you. We give a warm welcome. Well, okay. Um, my name is Natalie Zuckerman, just in case you don't know. Um, in 1990, when I was 12, I had an accident. Uh, it's not a car accident. I think it's quite a stupid accident. It was an accident in the scouts. We, were, we went to a summer camp up at the north of Israel, and we built in accordance with the annual issue that was the Israeli army, we built a, a, a tank from big logs of woods. This is where we all slept in the summer camp. Okay, so it was Saturday morning and I was sent to the kitchen to work. The kitchen was very far away and I was really scared of people I didn't know so I was afraid to go all the way to the, to the kitchen. So I lied. I said I had to bring something out of my bag. When I entered the tank, I heard Natalie, watch out. And then the structure of the tank fell on me. And uh, I broke a vertebra in my back. I was paralyzed. I was hospitalized for six months. And I had to learn to walk again. And I walked with crutches until I was about 16. Uh, even today, it still affects me. I limp, don't if you notice it. Uh, I can't run, I can't jump. And, um, and I can't climb the stairs without any help.
Hi. <coughs> My name uh, is Natalie Zuckerman. Uh, in 1990, when I was 12, I had an accident in the scouts and I broke a vertebra in my back. A at night at the hospital, uh, my mom asked Dr. Hanani, one meter, 90 centimeters, six foot two, if I would dance again. If she walks again, I will be pleased. I broke vertebra L1. Wait. Vertebra L1 is located around here. It was broken completely and was thrown into the trash. It was replaced with a bone taken from here, from my left pelvis. Um, and then the vertebra above it got twisted. So they had to put it back in its place. Then the surgeon took the two vertebras together, the new and the old, and they put on both sides of my spine two metal plates. And they left me with a scar. Uh, actually, I had a, an x-ray a few years ago, and, well, I found out that one of my metal plates is broken. Professor Deckel, January 1994. Scar length is 23 centimeters at the back of the spine in the thoracolumbar area. The scar is slightly ugly. Also, 10% permanent disability, not functional, due to the long scar on her back, according to section 75 on 1 on B. Hi, my name is Natalie Zuckerman. Uh, in 1990, when I was 12, I had an accident in the scouts and I broke a vertebra in my back. I was paralyzed. I was hospitalized for six months and I had to learn to walk again. I walked with crutches until I was about 16. Even today, it still affects me. I limp. I can't run, I can't jump, and I can't climb the cell without any help. Today, I'm almost 40, almost. 39, almost 40. And I graduated not so recently from Tel Aviv University, finishing my master's in performance. In one of the small performances that I did as part of my course, um, I did a small performance, and uh, Naama, she's a good friend of mine, she said to me after it, um, you always choose the liberty action that emphasizes disability.
Thank you. <laughs> Professor Dekel, January 90, 1991 till 1992. There is no doubt that her physical limitation undermine and disrupt her everyday routine and her integration in different social settings. She would be given psychological evaluation and follow-up support once or twice a week to accompany her integration in various social settings. In the x-ray given to her on her release day from the hospital, a satisfactory recovery of the fracture was shown. She does not participate in sports lessons. She doesn't go to the beach and she doesn't go on school trips. The plaintiff will not be able to work at the job that requires standing and walking. She'll be able to work full time only in a position that will allow her to sit down according to her education and skills. The plaintiff seems to be mentally stable and there is no need for therapy. In 2000, I moved to Scotland to study performance. In one of the, I think it was the first scene of one of the shows I performed in, we were asked to walk like runway models. Pamela, the director, she's a very good friend of mine, said to me if I would mind to open the show, the runway show, in order to emphasize my limp in comparison to the normal walk of the other models, performance, it was a great success. Everyone thought I was a former model. So the next night she came to me and she said, would you mind exaggerating your limp? It just didn't really work last night, no one noticed it. A social worker, Gideon Haas, December 1992, age 13. In my opinion, this is a girl who is highly motivated, socially accepted by her peers, and is not feeling sorry for herself. She doesn't suffer from depression, she doesn't keep to herself, and I think she accepted the situation in a very positive way. In my opinion, supported also by Professor Shako, she does not need therapy or psychotherapy. Moreover, I think the victim can serve as an example of a successful rehabilitation. When she will grow up, she will acquire a profession and will become a positive role model in society. Um, until a few years ago, I used to go on quite a lot of blind dates. Now, I don't want to sell them a pig and a poke because eventually the question arises, so what happened to your leg? And then what do I answer? Um, so I'd like to share with you a story that happened to me with, on a blind date with this guy called Tal. Uh, we arranged to meet in a cafe and by the time he got there, I already sat down. He was really good looking, quite tall, blonde, cute, and I think he really liked me too because we flirted. Um, and while we were talking, he asked me what am I working on. So I told him, I told him about the other body and about my injury. And as I'm talking, I noticed that he seeps deeper and deeper into his chair. His facial expression ranges between discomfort and agony. Tal, is everything okay? Uh, uh, I, I, uh, I feel like I'm drowning. But, but you go ahead, you go ahead and speak. This is your story, not mine. Oh, come on, Tal, you know, it's nothing. I tell the same story since I was 12. Hi, my name is Natalie Zuckerman. In 1990, when I was 12, I had an accident in the scouts and I broke a vertebra in my back. I was paralyzed, I was hospitalized in six months. I had to learn to walk again, I walk with crutches. You know, it's nothing. It doesn't feel like it's nothing. Okay, not really the answer you're looking for on your first date. <laughs> but somehow I managed to get this out of it. We talked about Hamlet and Shakespeare, if it's relevant to stage of the day or not relevant to stage of the day, but it wasn't really the same. When we got up to leave, my leg really shivered. Now go and explain to him that when I'm really nervous, I shiver much more and therefore I limp much more. Yes, I can see that you're limping. Okay, that was the end of the day, but then, no. He turned around and said to me, do you want me to come over? No. I mean, I, I teach tomorrow and I have to get up really early. Do you want to come maybe another night? Silence. 
You know what, Al? I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. I will give you a kiss on the cheek, a hug, and I'm going to go, okay? Okay. That will be the closest I'll be a ballerina. So that's kind of like really nice to, to do my speech when I'm sitting with a ballerina dressed. Um, well, what you just saw was part of The Other Body. The Other Body, is, uh, it's an hour and 20 minutes long, and this is a very small section of it, but I'm very grateful to show it to you today. Um, the Other Body was made only when I was 34. Not so long ago, now I'm 39. And I've been making work and being in the theatre business, if you would like to say, since I'm a child. And often I've been asked why. Why took you so long? Why only at the age of 34 you decided to be on stage? And I went to, a, I went to kind of have a soul-searching journey into my own, into myself. And I quite want to share my journey with you today. I want to talk to you today about uh, the difficulties the hard moments, but at the same time also the insights. All those moments were beautiful and painful at the same time that made me stand at the age of 34 and own my disability. The term disabled is not only as an artist, but also as a human being. And I would like to share that with you today. Um, when I made The Other Body in another show called Practice to Make Us Perfect, uh, and that was only in the last few years, um, you can place it under the category of disability arts or art ability. But um, I don't know, in Israel we don't have that kind of category. It's a non-existent category. And gladly here it is. So I could come and talk to you under that category today. And I would like to start my story as any good story starts. The beginning. So. I was born in 1978, uh, the eldest daughter out of three to Norit and David in Israel, had a beautiful, beautiful childhood, quite normal, I would say, you know, picket fence, white house, uh, a dog, few cats, really good childhood, and, um, and I was a very, very physical girl, and I loved singing and dancing, absolutely loved it. My aunt likes to say um, that in every family occasion, I made everyone dance the hokey pokey, mm -hmm. like the whole of my family. 
And I actually found a, a, a cassette not so long ago. My dad recorded me as a child singing many songs that come in the Eurovision. And I just invented them and I sang them happily and loudly and I danced. I danced everywhere, in every possible studio in the era where I grew up. And I wanted to be, to be a ballerina. That was the only thing I wanted to be. Um, I actually remind, it was, it's funny, I didn't think about it for so long, but um, there was one moment when I had this horrible crisis when I was about 11, and my dance teacher didn't want to let me learn how to stand on my toes like a ballerina. You know, I wasn't ready yet, because I was 11, but I was so hurt by it. And I was like, I didn't want to go back, and we had such a, a row that my mom had to make amends in order for me to go back. So it was really part of my passion, that's what I wanted to be. And it was also very physical. I was in the gymnastic team at school, in the running team at school, and I walked the fastest. No one walked more than me. No, no one walked faster than me. You know, everyone knew that. And then I was injured. And that kind of, you know, shattered my dream. And, and you know, it, maybe even I didn't know that at that time, but it really broke my heart. And I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want to talk about dance. I didn't want to see dance. I didn't want anyone around me to, to, to even say anything about it. I spoke to my mom just the other day and she told me, because I told her about what I'm doing here, and she told me that I got a gift. You know, like two ballerina shoes. And um, I was like, where is it? She was like, I throw it away. Because you couldn't handle it. You didn't want to talk about it. But you know how destiny and fate sometimes have, sometimes have a way of coming to you, approaching you, even when you don't want to, to do anything with it. So, next to, next to me, at my host, next to my hospital bed, um, lay there a girl named Tamar Boyle. Boyle, I don't know if some of you know her, she's a very well-known dancer and choreographer in the Israeli dancing. And she was injured when I was injured in a car accident. And um, she broke also a vertebrae in her back and she became paralyzed. She's in a wheelchair until today. Um, and I, I adored her. She's quite a scary woman, but, and I was a little child, but I really adored her. And I could see how she was struggling. She was struggling to cope with what's happened to her. And um, when she released, she continued to make work. And I was like, wow, you can be in a wheelchair and dance? That you know, that's like, as a child, that was amazing. A few years after I was released from the hospital, I met my old dance teacher. And she told me, oh, you know, I just met the Malboel, I went to see her perform. Okay, I was the most, I was like so excited to see how it was. So I asked her how, how it went. And she said, and I will never forget that, she said, uh, Tamal should leave the dancing for the dancers. Mm. And what she does, in my eyes, is doesn't consider to be dancing. And that stayed with me. I believed her. You know, it makes sense. How can someone in a wheelchair can dance? You know, that's kind of the stage. It's for those that can. And I couldn't. So I, 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 again, I was heartbroken. Um, but I was looking for a way to heal. In retrospect, I can say that. And I remember saying to my mom, I want to enroll to drama class. And so when I was 14, she enrolled me, but I had to do an audition first. At the time, I was uh, working with crutches. And um, I would never forget that day. It was, um, it was similar actually to this space. And I kind of went in, and I walked up the stage, and I put my crutches aside, and I sat on a chair because it's hard for me to stand for a very long time. I sat on a chair. And the whole of the auditorium was blacked out. And there was only one light. And that light was on me. And I started my monologue. And she looked at me. And I think it was the first time I enjoyed that someone was watching me. Because I don't know if, if you think about it, but when you're a teenager and you're walking with crutches, you have so many people looking at you. And it's exactly the, that age that you don't want anyone to look at you, especially when you are singled out 
you are the one that isn't like everyone else. And around me, where I lived, there were no disabled people. It was just me. And I had doctors examine, examining me on a weekly basis, had physiotherapists touch me on a weekly basis, um, private investigators on behalf of the social security office and uh, insurance companies were like following me, so I had to like close the curtains when I did things in order for not, not them, you know, to catch me doing something, trying to rehabilitate. And people down the streets and kids at school pointing and kind of gossiping because I was the one that was different. But, you know, I was just wearing crutch, I was just with crutches. Think of a disabled person. A disabled person performs on a daily basis. Uh, let's take uh, uh, a person in a wheelchair boarding a bus. You know, the, the, the bus has to stop, the driver has to stop the bus, open the back door, put the, take the ramp, pull it like a stage, and then the person in the wheelchair has to go on the bus, and everyone looks at him. It's like audience looking at an actor. So when you're a teenager, think how hard it is. What, a, what an intimidating experience. So, with that, and because I couldn't handle it, I decided that I don't want to have my crutches anymore. And when I was 16, I was allowed by my doctors to leave my crutches aside. And God, I enjoyed the fact that I could have walked without my crutches and no one knew I've got a disability. Well, when I managed to get out of it, you know, kind of, what happened to your leg, that kind of came up a lot. But until that moment, I loved it. No one here was disabled. Wow, that was like a, a fresh beginning, a start. But people that knew about my disability were very supportive. Like my school, for example. Um, I had to be taken to school every morning in a special drive, in this car drive. Um, and also, because of, I had a lot of back pains, I couldn't go to school a lot. So it was all approved by my teachers. I, it, they were fine with it, and I didn't have to come to school a lot, and had good grades also, so that was fine. Um, and because I couldn't run or do physical activities, I couldn't take part in sports lessons. So I was exempt from sports lessons. And I was also exempt from high school trips, because most high school trips in Israel, at least, they're taking you to the up north, you know, mountains, you have to hike, you have to like be very physical. And I was like, well, I can't do it. And they were like amazing actually. They were like, if you can't, that's fine. But I want you to look at it from another perspective. Think about it. What did I do except studying? Absolutely nothing. All my other friends had many activities, and I was the only activity I did was my peers were studying. I was excluded from almost any, any activity. And I know I can't run, and I know running is part of like sports lessons, but I do Pilates really well. And yoga, quite good at that also. You know, they could have changed the curriculum in order for me to take part or, I don't know, high school, you know, high school trips. Okay, I can't hike, but I can go to a museum. Quite good at going to museums. You know, they could change it to an easier route. But I didn't say anything. I just went, I can't do it. And they were like, yes, of course, if you can't, that, that's fine. You know, they didn't, I can see their point also. You know, I said I can't, and they were like, that's, that's fine. Sit aside, it's, it's okay. I'm a teacher today, and I'm on the other side of the spectrum. And I can't help it by wondering, wasn't it the easiest way out for the system to exclude me? Because, you know, I was the teenager. I was the 14-year-old. They were like the 40, 50-something. They could have, you know, make an effort, try to do something for me, fight for me. But that's the way it worked. And it just made more sense, you know, I said I can't, and they were like, that's okay, and we both agreed that it's better for me to stay at home. So that was kind of my life at that point. Um, at the age of 18, graduating from high school, and in Israel you go to the army, quite positive that you know, uh, 
and then I was excluded again and was told I won't be able to be drafted. So again, not being part with everyone. Um, I decided instead, well, I can study acting. I'm quite good at that, that's what I want to do. I'll be an actress. And, I'm, and I start phoning acting schools, which also turned out to be slightly problematic. I want to tell you about one encounter that I had. I phoned one of the biggest acting schools in Israel and was asked why I didn't go to the army. So I had to tell them, hi, my name is Natalie Zuckerman in 1990. Again, tell my story over and over again. Uh, and was asked if I will be able to take movement classes. It's like, I don't think I will, I've got this disability. Then we were really, really sorry, again, that's sorry. We we're so sorry, but we won't even be able to audition you. Okay. Actually, I see why. You know, an actor needs to be versatile. An actor needs to be able to do all the things, movement things. And they need to be like, on one hand, a chameleon. But then on the other hand, there is a thing called typecasting. So, how many characters do you know that have a limp? Oedipus? Richard III? Uh, Laura? And, and, yeah, three? I know three. And you know, and I didn't even see in the Israeli, see, in the Israeli theater scene disabled people at all, ever. You probably, you can say, and that will be right, that was 20 years ago. So what has changed? You know, 20 years ago have passed. Um, still in the Israeli theater scene, you will he see um, hearing actors play deaf characters or able actors playing, you know, disabled characters. You won't see anything else. I even read this article that I want to share with you about, uh, uh, she's an emerging disabled actress that's my definition of her. She might say she's an emerging actress. And she talked about her ordeal to get into the acting schools in Israel. And that was maybe five years ago when she tried to go in. She wasn't accepted to any of them. And then she decided to do an experiment. In her last audition, she lied. She said she twisted her ankle because she had a disability similar to mine. Guess what? She got in. So, two weeks later, when they realize her twisted ankle isn't going away, no, it's not getting better, she was called into the head of the, of the acting, to the office of the head of the acting school, and was told she's on probation. Guess why she's on probation? Not because she lied, you know, that would make sense, because they told her that they are not sure there is enough um, room for a disabled performer. That might not really work because they're not sure they have like roles for her. So she was on probation. So when you're 18 years old and that's what you hear the whole time that you don't have a place, then you get the message. And you more than that you get the message, you believe it. Actually, okay, I don't have a place on stage, you know, because I why? Why should I be here? So I decided to go and be up behind the scenes and study directing. And I went to study in Seminar Kibbutzim College. And again, even when you're a director, you have to take acting classes. You have to take movement classes. I was like, I can't, I can't take part. You know, I can't, I can't do it. And, and actually, I have to be honest, um, it was very hard to watch. Because when I was watching, I could see what everyone can do and I can't. And that was really, again, kind of opened my, my broken heart a bit. But at the same time, again, no one said to me, oh, come on, maybe we'll change the classroom a bit, we'll change like the curriculum. No one said anything. So again, I knew that it wasn't my place. There was one change, small change, that really kind of made a difference to me. It was in my third year. One of the tutors asked us, to perform, a, 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 to make a performance, a theatrical event, in which we introduce ourselves to our classmates. Now, we've been together for three years, so I was like, what can I, what, what can I tell about, about me that my classmates don't know about me? So, I decided instead of choosing a character, I decided to be myself on stage. And I will perform actions that they never saw me do. 
and I danced. I didn't dance for 10 years, and I danced then. And I asked people from the audience to come and dance with me. And in another segment, I exposed my back and asked people to color paint my scar. And I could hear people were crying. And I could see people were like, wow. And it was the first time I got that kind of reaction. I was like, wow, I enjoy being here. And I've got a story. My body has a story to tell. So I decided that in Israel, I have no place. I have to find somewhere else that will be able to explore it, understand what I felt at that moment. Because it was obvious at my school that that's not the, uh, that that's not the way they're going to, to go ahead with. And I moved to Scotland. Uh, I have to say also that it was a dream of mine, because my, both of my parents, my dad studied at UCLA many years ago, my mom studied in London, and I was really sheltered as a child, obviously because of my injury. So I wanted to find my independence, and I wanted to discover my body again, and I enrolled to, um, to school, to the academy in, in Glasgow. And um, in there, I studied divine theater and performance art, which I knew straight away that it will be based more about me and about my stories and not so much about characters. So I knew maybe there I would find my place. Uh, and it was also based on group work and, and uh, collaborative process. So first class, first day, yay, playing tag. I was like, OK. I can't play tag, obviously. Went to my professor. In Britain, you say tutor, but here you say professor. Went to my professor. Um, Hi, my name is Natalie Zuckerman. In 1990, when I was 12, I had an accident. Um, I think how many times I have to say that. Since I was 12, at least once a week. I'm 40 almost now, so you do the math. And how much anxiety it produces when I have to say that again and again. You know what? I hate to be singled out. Because, hey, see, I'm disabled, wow. And I don't want to. I wanted to disappear. I, I, I like being behind the, 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 the scenes. Even, even when I knew that I want to be in front, of the, in front of the stage, at the same time, you know, I've heard so much that that's not my place that at the same time as I wanted to hide. So I came to him and I said to him, and I'm so used to that look of, oh. And they're actually trying, they're saying, we're so sorry. They're not saying we're sorry, but that's kind of the look of. Yes, of course, you can sit aside, that's fine. He didn't say that. He just kept asking me questions. And I remember thinking, that's weird. And then he said, here, everyone takes part. We we'll just have to invent new rules for the game. The rules won't define who we are. We will define the rules. We will define the game. Which meant there were those who can take part and those who can't take part. Everyone can take part. It will be difficult. It won't be easy. But we'll find a way. Wow. That was like, uh, uh, you know, like when a lightning just like appears. I was like. I have to take part, I'm taking part. Does that mean I never took part until now? You know, it really blew my mind. It was such a, 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 a moment of realization that I can be part. Someone's actually saying to me, you're part of us. Someone's fighting for me. Someone's not letting me to, to go away. And it really changed me. It really changed the way I looked at my body, the way I looked at myself. And I started to take part in movement classes. It wasn't easy because my tutors were not from, the, from my department. They were from the acting department. And they were so used to the kind of, again, you know, acting needs to be very physical. But I have to say, they did their best. And what they learned, I think, and what I learned, that even if I can't do the exercise the right way, there isn't the right way. There's beauty also in the imperfection. There is beauty in the failure. And you know what? No one can shiver like me. <laughs> I've got the best shiver leg ever. And it's beautiful. And that was like, wow. I even remember one time I did a, 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 I had to choreograph a dance and to perform. 
and I did a dance with a chair again, my best friend, my chair. And my tutor was so proud of me. He was like, I could, I remember his face like lit up because it was good. God, I was good. I made things that were good, even if it wasn't to the appropriate criteria. Around that time, I also realized that I never, ever associated the word disabled with my physicality, <coughs> with my situation. <coughs> never had disabled friends. Remember I told you about the car drive that took me to school? Many disabled kids were with me. I don't remember any of their names. How is that possible? And in, I've got a journal that I wrote when I was injured, and I refer that to myself as being almost disabled. Because people with disability, disabled people were people in a wheelchair. Like a girl was lying next to me. She was in a wheelchair, she was the miserable one. And I was the one that got away. And also, I have to say that everyone else in the hospital also treated me the same way. They, they, they didn't treat me as disabled. They were like, well, you can walk. So I had a lot of people trying and helping me to walk. No one talked about me being dis with, with disability. I was the girl with the limb. And that was that. When I moved to Israel and I started referring to myself, and I moved back and I started referring to myself as being with disability or being disabled, I used to get that, and I got that many times. You're not disabled. Being, people being so mad at me. And on one hand, it was very flattering. But at the same time, I was like, why are you so scared of the word disabled? Why are you so scared of it? And I went to do some kind of research. And I came to the conclusion that the world is divided into two groups of people. Those who are disabled now, and those who will be disabled in the future. We are all ladies and gentlemen on the spectrum of disability. You know, <laughs> replacement, caretaker, nursing home, we're all going there. And that's why, that's why people are so scared of it because they see that in themselves, if they want to admit it or not. So I wanted to make work about my disability. I wanted to start looking at inclusion. I wanted to, you know, um, find the meeting point with, between society and, and, and disability. And I was trying to think, where does my disability perform itself? Well, not at home, because at home everything is accommodated to my needs, but outside. And I realized that my biggest enemy, the most vicious enemy for me, is the staircase. I hate staircases. Because for me to walk up the stairs, that, oh my god, I have to really think about it. And I can't, I can't just walk up, I need to use the railing. I don't know for you, but most people just, well, that's the way it seems to me, they just walk up the stairs, they don't really need to think about it. But for me, it's a big deal. And I hate, I hate it, you know, when you go to a staircase and there's a, um, a, a sign saying fresh paint. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. And then I have to walk up like a little child, two steps at a time. And then again, I'm singled out and all of a sudden I'm the disabled that can't do it. And again, not the position I want to be in a lot of the time, even today. So I decided I'm going to make a piece about it. And I found the busiest staircase and I wore this beautiful black evening dress. And I started to go up and down. And I wanted to do it like an able person, which meant that every time I didn't do the, the step the right way, I had to do it again. So from a five minutes piece, it became a three hour piece, a original piece. And I was invited to perform it in the uh, Jerusalem Cinematheque. I don't know if you know, but some of you probably know, in Jerusalem Cinematheque, there's a huge staircase in the middle of it. And it was part of a disability art festival. So I put my black dress on, the middle of the staircase, start going up and down, and I'm obviously very slow. And I'm very slow, and I became the element that interferes with the flow of the crowd. And then I'm hearing people shouting at me, oh, get off, get off, just to remind you. We're in a disability art festival. <laughs> Some people were very nice, and they asked me if I want to take the elevator, or if, they want to, if I need help. And in the corner of my eye, I see this guy, and he's standing with his crutches, looking at me for about three to four hours. When it was all done, he came to me, and he said he had several palsy. 
And he said to me, the things that happen to you here, this is my everyday life. This is what happens to me on a daily basis. This is what I hear on a daily basis. And I hate it. I want to walk up the stairs. They should let me. It was the very first time for me that someone that we will all say that he's disabled said we share the same experience, that we share the same feeling. And I realized it was time to stop hiding. It was time to say, I, I've got a disability, I'm disabled also. And I'm part of a community, who knew? That was amazing. When I was 19, a day before a trip to New York, my first time in New York, I uh, bumped my pinky toe at my parents' coffee table. It doesn't relate especially to my injury, but it meant I couldn't walk properly and I had to take my crutches with me. Thank you to my crutches. At JFK, I didn't have to stand in any of the queues. And also in the Phantom of the Opera or in the Statue of Liberty. I could just walk straight away. Um, the crutches gave me an inner and outer affirmation that I need help. That I, you know, I can't stand and I can't, and I, therefore you can have help. And without the crutches, I'm always afraid, and I walk with crutches for many years, that no one will see it. No one will, everyone will think I'm faking it. And you know what? I've heard a lot, the two adjectives of you're so tired or you're so lazy most of my ch childhood life. And that really seeps into your personality when you hear those kind of stuff. Only in the last few years, I realized that my laziness is actually part of my disability. I'm so tired because it takes, everything takes so much, so much effort. I only realized that at the age of 30 something. That moment of understanding that I'm part of a community is a moment I realized I need to stop hiding and I need to start claiming my rights. I was excluded. And not just I was excluded, I actually believed in this exclusion, I was like, yeah, that's fine, you're right. I'm not supposed to be part of it. I'm not supposed, that's okay. I adapted their point of view. And that was enough. Enough was enough. And that's what I decided I'm going to make a show about it. And it only then, I had enough courage to come into the light, to stand there and say, I'm disabled, lifting a sign over my head. You know, there's one thing I realized in the last few years. I might not have characters that I can play, but I can play myself quite well on stage. And you know what? They might not want us on stage, but they'll get us anyway. Because others' bodies in different shapes need to be seen on stage, need to be shown. Thank you very much for listening to me today. Thank you.